Um, I'll, I'll be reading from that um, today. There are a couple of different ways to engage students with oral histories when you only have the text. Um, depending on the learning style of your students, you can read to them. Uh, you could invite students to volunteer to take turns reading. Uh, it can actually be really powerful to have multiple students read the same section of an oral history because we all add different inflections and it changes the way we uh, understand the text. Um, and, and we could also invite students to read silently to themselves. I'm going to read this out loud for us now, um, this first excerpt from the oral history. And before I start, I want to reflect on something Michael mentioned earlier about taking others lead on how they refer to themselves and on how the language we use, um, especially around queer communities has evolved over time. So today, uh, we're going to spend time with two oral history excerpts by uh, from a woman named Rusty Brown. Uh, she lived in Brooklyn before and during World War II. And in the first excerpt that we'll start with, she uses terminology to refer to herself that some folks would choose not to use today and might even find offensive. Uh, but we will be taking her lead on how she identifies. All right. When I was young, I didn't even know what was wrong with me. Uh, they had me to a psychiatrist. And for a while, I was beginning to wonder if the psychiatrist, if they were right. Maybe I did need a psychiatrist. I got along fine with the boys in school, but as one of the boys, I felt very embarrassed and uncomfortable when I was with the girls and I couldn't understand why. I'm supposed to be a girl. How come I can't talk about the things that they talk about? And I'd get very embarrassed and I'd get red in the face and they'd make fun of me. But with the boys, I didn't have that. I got along fine with them until I got a bit older. And then it seemed like I was competing with them. I could outrun them, outfight them, outclimb them. And girls, as they said, wasn't supposed to do that. I said, what am I supposed to do if I can run faster? What am I supposed to do? They said, you're supposed to let them win. I said, the hell I'm going to let them win. If they can't win on their own, I'm not going to let them. So I got into a little bit of trouble. But it wasn't until I was about eight or going on nine, eight years old, and I had run away from home a few times and they sent me to an institution. They called it the SPCC. It was the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And it was there I came up against some older girls. And I walked into the room this first time I got there. I walked into the room. The first thing I hear them say is, hey, we got another dyke. And I turned around and looked at them and I says, I am? And I didn't. The first time I had a name for it and I breathed a sigh of relief. I'm not alone. Maybe I'm not crazy after all. And that was when I found out who and what I was from the older ones. So thinking about the oral history we've just listened to, I would love if anyone wants to share in the chat uh, what stood out to you most and what questions you have. Um, you may also want to reflect, if you were sharing this with your students, what do you think might stand out to them most? Mm, yeah, her searching felt so genuine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Her relief, totally. Her relief is like so tangible in that last bit. Um, feeling different, but not knowing why. Um, feeling a pang of sadness with uh, the way she used the name versus how it was used on her. Uh, her awareness of the way she felt. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Um, a great question. What was the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and what did they do there? That is a great question. Um, yeah. I cannot tell you everything about them. Um, I've come across their name in historic material. And so it's a great topic for um, doing more research with students. Um, I feel like many kids feel awkward in social situations but 
especially LGBTQ plus kids, and I empathize with them. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so this, this first, in looking at this first um, oral history, what we would do with students um, after listening to this together and really taking time to empathize uh, with Rusty and reflect on this moment of like self identity, self discovery, um, we would invite students to do some kind of creative response. And I think that this is something that you might imagine differently based on, on the group of students you're working with, the um, way that they like to express themselves creatively and, and show empathy. Um, we imagined things like, um, if you could write a letter to eight-year-old Rusty, to just like let her know that things are gonna be okay, what would you write? Um, or if you could share something from your own life with Rusty, what would you write? Or if you just wanted um, to uh, help Rusty feel seen, what kind of um, creative work would you express? I don't know if anyone has any other ideas that you'd like to share in the chat of ways that you might invite your students to um, respond creatively uh, to this oral history and to Rusty and the situation she's describing. I will say I'm not going to take time to actually do the creative response with all of us today um, because I'm, I'm not going to have you all sit at home and um, write while we are on Zoom. Um, so I am going to move on to the second part, but this first part could um, take up a whole class period um, with discussion, um, with thoughtful reflection, um, or you could include the second part uh, in um, in the same, the same period of time. So the second part moves us along to a second oral history. Again, this is included in um, your booklet. And um, before sharing it with students, depending on the um, amount of historic context and, and um, yeah, kind of prior knowledge that students have, I would probably share a little bit to contextualize the second reading. First of all, Rusty mentions Bellevue, and this refers to Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital, which is a mental health hospital in New York City. Uh, Rusty also describes going from one ward to another. Students might not be familiar with the term ward, but in a hospital, a ward is a section with its own uh, patients and its own nurses. So again, I will read uh, this second excerpt. Rusty is in conversation with Len, who's the person who's or, uh, interviewing her for the oral history. So Rusty starts off. When I heard it again, when I was 16, and they sent me back again to, the, to Bellevue for a psychiatric. And that's when I found out they were going to give me shock treatments. And I didn't know what shock treatments was. So I wandered around and wandered into another ward. I went to a nurse who didn't know me from my ward and I says, uh, can I ask you something, nurse? She says, it depends. I says, I understand one of your patients is getting shock treatments tomorrow. I says, what are they? And she explained to me what they were. I thought, oh no, they don't. Oh no, they don't. And that was when I split. I found a nurse's uniform in the closet. I put it on and I just walked out of the hospital. Well, Bellevue is so damn big and there's so many exits and anybody wearing a nurse's uniform, who's gonna stop them? And that's how I got out. And Len responds, it's a good thing, huh? Rusty says, yeah, and that was about 1939 or so. And I could see World War II was coming since I was old enough and I had enough intelligence. I could read the newspapers and understand what Hitler was doing. And I knew it was a matter of time before we'd be in the middle of it. So I just joined the service. 
That was the answer to my problem because getting a job without a high school diploma, I mean, I hadn't really been trained for anything. The work I like to do, they wouldn't let me do because I was a girl. They wouldn't let me in the machine shop and I was always sneaking in there and working with the tools, but they chased me out again. So I got in the Navy and I got to do all the stuff I wanted to do. Worked with all the tools and machinery I wanted and I had no problems. I love um, Stella in the chat, thank you. Yeah, go Rusty. Um, so exciting. So um, sometimes when we work through a historic document like an oral history, it's really helpful to just spend time analyzing that afterwards um, and pulling up some DBQs to, um, to make sure that students have engaged with it and understood um, all of the information that we presented. And we have a few um, sample questions here. Um, feel free to throw some responses in the chat. How did Rusty Brown escape from the mental health hospital? Um, Rusty says she joined the service, and this refers to joining the Navy. What reasons did Rusty get for doing this? Uh, according to Rusty, what had previously happened when she tried to work with tools in the machine shop? And finally, how was working in the Navy different from what re Rusty had previously experienced? Uh, so we'd spend time looking over the oral history, uh, really examining the text, oops, here we go, and, um, and finding some responses to those questions. I'm also really curious to know though, before we go on, if anyone has any questions about this excerpt from the oral history, anything that surprised you, anything that you want to know more about. All right, then I will move along. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you think of anything, um, feel free to throw your questions in there. Uh, so what I would do next with this source is I would actually introduce a, a research skill that I think is really important, really transferable to other research, but so important, um, I think in the context of, of this source, and, and I'll explain why in a moment. But um, we would talk about how researchers use multiple sources to corroborate a historic narrative. Corroboration might be a new um, term for students. And so we explained that it means finding evidence to support a statement or a theory. Uh, I find that corroboration can be really helpful when we find a historic narrative that we haven't heard about before. Um, if students come across a history like Rusty's that is really not represented in their textbooks, they may have a lot of questions. They may want to um, see proof um, or understand more context. So additional sources and corroborating those sources, teaching students how to corroborate the sources, um, can provide that additional context and um, really empower students to reimagine and, um, and rewrite some of the historic narratives that they have been presented with. So the first source that we would use to corroborate Rusty's oral history is from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. I have it up here on my screen. And um, it's a set of employment ads from September 5th, 1939. Now remember, um, Rusty talked about getting out of Bellevue in 1939. So this is around the time um, that she was looking for work. So. Now, how do these employment ads um, support Rusty's statement about the kinds of work that she had been allowed to do and, and also about her, her job search in general? Um, so I see in the chat um, race, gender. Sure, does anyone want to? Elaborate on that. Um, oh, women are only being asked to, or hired to do domestic work. Mm -hmm. Anything else stand out to anyone?
Um, one other thing that stood out to me is that Rusty talked um, about joining the service. And we see in the right hand, hand column under help wanted mail, the second job posting, yeah, I see in the chat now, draftsman. It's gender specified in this um, ad for Navy work. Uh, but Rusty says that she was able to um, join the service and do that work as well. And yet what we're seeing in the newspaper really corroborates her, her story that like there were men's jobs and there were women's jobs. Her way around that, she says, was um, joining the Navy. Um, so we have one other source that can help us corroborate this. Um, it's a photograph. It was published in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in uh, February 1949. Um, it's titled She Knows How. Um, and it, it's referring to this woman as a commonly referred to as a WAC, W-A-A-C, stands for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. These women helped the army during World War II. And so the caption for this photo said, this WAC just arriving at Camp Upton with a large contingent started work immediately by giving this truck a thorough goring over. Fighting men won't have to bother with this sort of thing anymore. Um, so how, um, how does this photo support Rusty's statement about the kind of work women were allowed to do in the Navy? Um, yeah, thank you. So in the chat, uh, this shows the break from gender work expectations that we saw in our previous source. Um, in, and I think that these sources kind of bring Rusty's story to life for me. Um, I like reading things, but I also love seeing things. And some of your students might might feel the same way. They, you know, they read Rusty's story, but then to be able to see um, uh, advertisements that separate out um, jobs uh, for men and women, and then see this photo of this woman who honestly looks like she's having a pretty great time in her coveralls, tuning up a truck, um, just really build out Rusty's narrative for us. So our aim with doing this activity with students is to give space, st students space to practice historic empathy and learn about the history of LGBTQ life in New York City. Um, and through this activity, we're interacting with oral history. Uh, we're encountering narratives of queer resistance. And I wanna highlight that in this case, I really feel like Rusty's existence alone is her resistance. Um, the, the way that she kept, um, uh, kind of uh, persevering in really difficult situations, escaping from Bellevue. Um, it's really, really impressive to me. Um, as I noted, we've, we've uh, invited students to pr practice historic empathy and uh, use different sources to corroborate each other, which is a really terrific um, research skill that students will then be able to um, transfer to other contexts and also use in the context specifically of mining these um, narratives that they might not find in traditional textbooks, traditional curriculum. You and students can work together to find the sources that um, corroborate each other and, and build out new narratives. Um, and one, um, question in the chat. Mm. Thank you, Maureen. Um, so going back to Rusty's oral history, Rusty includes the word dyke and later says it came up again when I was 16. Um, wondering about that word and its meaning over time and what advice you have for teachers who teach elementary. Um, I would absolutely love any other teachers who teach um, elementary who have had conversations about this with students and parents to weigh in in the chat. Um, I think it may depend on the context that you are working in, the community you're in. Um, it may be useful to ask around in advance um, other teachers and parents um, and, and have honest conversations with students about language and the way um, 
the way words evolve and the way that we use, we, we follow other, other folks lead to um, respect the way that they identify, uh, but understand that in some contexts we wouldn't use um, those words and labels now. Yeah. Um, really great question. And it's a, it's a tricky thing, um, but conversations worth having with students, I absolutely think. Um, so thank you for taking this little journey with me and Rusty, and I'm going to pass things back now to Michael. Thank you, Jen. This will just take me one second to get set up. Sorry. Um, one second, everyone. It's been a year and I'm still not used to Zoom. Um, all right. So, hi. <laughs> Um, great to be back with you all. Um, so I am going to spend a little time sharing some of the resources available in the Brooklyn Museum's collection that can illuminate ideas of queer identity and activism through art. In a little while, we'll take a closer look um, at one work of art together. But first, I want to just show you a few of my favorite works from the collection and talk about some of the ideas they bring up related to gender and sexuality. Very quickly, uh, I just ask that folks have pencil and paper handy as we'll use them later on. So if you want to grab those now, that would be great. Um, as I mentioned earlier, something I think about a lot in my teaching is centering queer agency. Of course, I might be biased, uh, but I think that art is one of the most powerful sites for expressions of agency. Through art, artists are able to uh, actively construct an image and force viewers to contend with that vision, whatever it may be. Through this act of creating, artists exert their power over the image and into the world. I hope you'll keep this in mind as I share some work with you tonight. We're gonna to touch on three kind of major themes, portraiture, activism, and history related to queer visual culture. Please know that these are absolutely not clear cut categories. A lot of the works I'm gonna share touch on more than one of these areas. Um, and they're certainly not the only themes that run through traditions of queer visual culture either. That said, I hope uh, that this will help provide kind of a loose framework for looking at and teaching from works of art made or depicting queer and trans people. So first up is portraiture. Um, and just to offer a little historical context here, in the early 20th century, as you might imagine, being openly, openly queer was dangerous and largely prohibited. The same was true in visual art. Yet artists found ways to signal queerness through coded imagery. Sometimes this was subtle, something like a butterfly or a light touch between two, two people in a painting. Um, could sort of signal queer leanings, right? Sometimes it wasn't subtle. Images, for example, depicting a bunch of half-naked men in really close proximity. Either way, queer artists have been making queer images for a long time. Even if sometimes it was under the radar, these acts of self-representation and self-determination, these were acts of self-representation and self-determination within the parameters of heteronormativity. This portrait of, portrait of the artist Paul Cadmus is a great example. Cadmus is considered by many to be the first openly gay uh, American artist, and this portrait of him feels defiant. His head is tilted forward and his eyes gaze directly at the viewer, and that gaze is especially important here. For a long time, eye contact was one way to signal sexuality and desire to another person. If the eye contact was returned, you could move forward with flirtation, presumably with less danger. In the context of this portrait, Cadmus's gaze is both alluring and confrontational, much like his art. If you're not familiar with his art, please look it up. We don't have much at the museum, but it's, it's worth checking out. Queer artists continue to use portraiture as a site for rethinking representation and reclaiming power to this day. This work by Micheline Thomas, A Little Taste Outside of Love, is a great example. Thomas is a queer Black woman. Using everyday materials like sequins and rhinestones, she creates multi-layered images drawing from diverse sources. Here she is referencing the image of the odalisque, uh, court ladies and sometimes concubines who were common subjects in 19th century European painting, as well as sort of black exploitation film, uh, reappropriating these styles to create a portrait that feels glamorous, empowered, and gentle all at once. Uh, I wanted to include this work by the artist El Perez as well, um, as I often think of it as a kind of portrait. Perez's work is predominantly portraiture, often photographing queer and trans people of color. There's no figure in this photograph which depicts a binder, a garment used often by trans folks uh, to compress the, uh, their breasts, yet it still speaks to ideas of self-representation and determination amongst queer and trans communities. Queer artists and their art have also been concerned explicitly with activism for a long time. One of the most famous examples shown here is the Silence Equals Death poster. This image created by a collective of queer designers was a call to action amidst the early years of the AIDS epidemic. 
Government bodies were largely ignoring the crisis while queer people continued to die at alarming rates. The pink triangle is a reference to the symbol used by Nazis to demarcate queer people during the Holocaust and was chosen to connect the AIDS crisis to legacies of queer oppression and create a universalizing symbol that queers could rally behind. The poster also uses two layers of text. The kind of big silence equals death as printed large and boldly to draw viewers in. Um, and then a second smaller register of text beneath it uh, condemns Reagan and the CDC and others for their continued denial of the AIDS crisis um, and calls for queers to turn anger, fear, and grief into action. Ultimately, the pink triangle and the slogan silence equals death were embraced by the activist group Act Up, activist group Act Up uh, and have become an iconic symbol for queer resistance. Other artists have followed in these traditions of art as a form of act activism. Zanelli Moholy, for example, takes portraits like the one shown here of Black queer communities in South Africa. Although South Africa has the reputation as being a gay-friendly country, queer people of color still face systemic oppression and violence. Moholy uses photography to highlight these communities and, as we discussed before, uh, to create a space where her subjects have agency over how they're represented. Adejoke to, excuse me, Adejoke Tabi Ele's uh, Gele Pride flag is another interesting example. She creates artwork out of everyday materials and here has used six Gele, a type of headscarf worn by Nigerian women, to create the familiar image of a rainbow pride flag. By merging queer iconography with Nigerian textiles, she has created an artwork that speaks to her own identity as a queer woman of Nigerian descent. She has also carried this flag at protests or pride events, and speaking about her work has said, Activism helps me stay in touch with the issues and ideas I respond to in my work. My work in turn educates and empowers others in the LGBT movement in Nigeria and beyond. Both depend on each other. Many queer artists also grapple explicitly with issues of queer history. Because these histories are often overlooked or tainted by heteronormative ideology, uh, there are so many stories that remain to be re-examined and uplifted. The video, the video work Salisha by Tourmaline is a great example. Tourmaline, a Black trans woman utilizes archival research as an important part of her practice. Here she has created a six minute video about Mary Jones, a black trans sex worker who lived in New York in the 1830s. There aren't many historical records of Jones's life. Most of what exists are sensationalized newspaper articles and court transcripts. So Tourmaline has created her own account using her imagination to fill in the gaps. The work is at once historical and imaginative, creating a dignified portrait that serves as a counter narrative to some of the sensationalized offensive accounts of Jones's life. So, oh, why is this going backwards? Excuse me. Um, so Salisha was first shown at the Brooklyn Museum in an exhibition called Nobody Promised You Tomorrow, Art 50 Years After Stonewall. This exhibition, which opened at the museum in 2019 and marked the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, was incredible and looked at dozens of artists, including many queer and trans artists of color, all born after Stonewall. Quickly, I want to just note here that this exhibition will be traveling to California State University in Fresno later this year, uh, and a catalog is also being published about it, which is great. So if you're in California, I definitely hope you'll check it out. And if not, I hope you'll consider looking out for the catalog, which will be an incredible resource for learning about queer contemporary art. One of the central works in Nobody Promised You Tomorrow was by the artist LJ Roberts, and we're going to focus on that work for the remainder of my time. This portion will be a little more interactive uh, and will include some discussion. Uh, I'll also share some of the strategies I've used to engage students with this work in the past. Just for a little more context, uh, the museum commissioned Roberts to create this work specifically for Nobody Promised You Tomorrow, based on an artist book they made previously called Bricks and Stones. The work is pretty monumental, as you can see here. Um, and three-dimensional. Luckily, Roberts has a great uh, video kind of documenting the piece on their website. So we're gonna start by watching the video together. There's a lot going on in this piece. Uh, if I were teaching from this in person, normally we would do like multiple rounds of walking around it just to sort of get started. Um, so one way to break it down that I would encourage folks to use, um, if you have that, that paper and pencil, if you wanna take notes on your computer, that's fine too, um, but sort of, divided into thirds, uh, have one that says images, one third that says text, one third that says form. Um, so form meaning sort of materials, composition, light, any sort of formal qualities about the work. Um, while we're watching the video, I would love for folks to just sort of take notes on things that stand out to them in each of these three categories. Anything that you notice, um, just write it down. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch over to the video now. All right, 
Can everyone see that okay? I'm going to assume yes. Um, so this video is kind of long. It's about six minutes. Um, I swear that there is, um, there's a lot to see. So please just bear with me. Um, and as I said, just take notes on different things that you're noticing while we're watching, and then we'll come back together afterwards.
I think we can kind of pause it there. Um, so while I go back to my PowerPoint, um, I would love for folks to share any sort of observations that they they had, anything that stood out to them. Um, I think in either of these three categories is, is totally fine. Um, folks are welcome to do that in the chat, or if you are uh, feeling, feeling brave, you're welcome to unmute and just share sort of what you noticed. So just any details in that work that stood out to you while you were watching the video? The use of collage and clippings and light boxes. Yeah, um, I think light boxes is, is a good way to describe them. Um, so there are these images and pieces of text kind of collaged onto these light boxes. You can actually see even like the tape used to hold them up. Um, in some places, right? Um, so images of queer icons like Marsha P. Johnson, uh, Stormy, yes. Um, contrasting light and dark. Um, no color, only black and white text and images. Um, oh yeah. Um, Janina, um, you're, you're welcome to speak if you'd like to. Thank you. Um... And yes, it, I um, thank you also for saying my um, saying my name right. I know sometimes people mess it up, um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, I just kind of correct them, but I appreciate it. Um, I also really like the text and images. Um, it, re it reminds me of Lorna Simpson, uh, Lorna Simpson's work, and I appreciate the white boxes as well. I think that it's um, it reminds me of Lorna Simpson's work, and then it also reminds me of another artist. I don't remember their name. But they take um, newspaper clippings and headlines and stuff, and they also they, like, they scribble them out with red pen and rewrite them um, to say what it actually means. So this was this was a very nice um, combination of those two other artists that I admire. Um, and I just want to echo what everyone already said in the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love that connection to Lorna Simpson, um, and I'm not sure what other artists you're talking about, but definitely like a lot of connections to other artists using like found like newspaper clippings, right, and and editing them. Um, one of the things that's really striking about Robert's work, I think, is um, the way that they, in some cases, have like a full block of text or a quote. In some cases, they repeat a word or phrase or like remove certain words or phrases. Um, so definitely a lot of like playfulness with with this found text. Um, and I'm just seeing some other comments in the chat. Um, the words were so striking in response to how the community was identified and labeled, totally um, different way to share important information through various media. And then um, the way the installation is designed gives the viewer a chance to process and understand and make connections at their own pace. Um, Gretchen, if you're comfortable, I would love it if you would unmute and maybe say more about that, like how you think this um, allows viewers to kind of take their time and make connections. Um, Hi, sure. Um, I'm having dinner with my family, but I can tell you what I was thinking. I just, I think a, what I understood is just like, I think it's very open and generous of the artists to display the work in this format because I feel like it's, it's welcoming and um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, for, for many people, these issues and ideas might be difficult. And so I think it's generous to allow it in so many formats and just a minute. And I think that that's, you know, I think it's very thoughtful and intentional on the artist's part to make the work accessible. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for, for um, unmuting in spite of being a family dinner, I appreciate it. Um, and then, yeah, I saw Sarah dropped in the chat something as well about this repeated phrase, um, uh, like the, the repeated um, correction that Roberts is using um, throughout this installation. Um, so, oh, it's not on the slide. Um, but yeah, so that that correction, um, which is actually from the New York Times, and I'll say more about that in a minute, um, comes up quite a bit. 
So I wanted to share a little bit more about this work um, and sort of along the way, I'll just share a few of the prompts I've used with students. We won't kind of discuss them um, e each, but uh, just to give you an idea of how, how I've approached this work before. Um, so as you all notice, this work combines a lot of different elements, um, including uh, images of this uh, figure, Stormy DeLarvery, uh, when she was young, someone she was older, images of queer West Village architecture, um, it uses a variety of texts, primarily from the New York Times, sometimes as direct quotes, sometimes as fragments. Um, and it presents them in this kind of collage, nonlinear fashion. Even the way the screens are arranged feels kind of like a collage, right? And I think that ties to what Gretchen was saying. Um, you kind of can't take this work in in a linear way or like all at once. You have to encircle it and, and find parts of it and build these connections in your own way. Um, so at this point, I would generally share with students, uh, the work is called Stormy at Stonewall. Um, I saw someone mention Stormy in the chat. Um, so it's about Stormy DeLarvery. Um, and I would generally ask students, you know, what, based on what you're seeing in the sculpture, um, who do you think Stormy might have been? Um, so Stormy was a biracial lesbian drag king who performed with the famed group The Jewel Box Review and an activist. Many cite her as having thrown the first punch at Stonewall. Um, next, I would probably share a little bit more kind of context. Uh, so the quote about at least one lesbian at Stonewall, that correction you kept seeing, um, is from a pretty recent article, 2016 in the New York Times, about a monument called Gay Liberation. Uh, this was meant to be a monument to the Stonewall uprising, but there is obviously a lot to unpack here. Um, at this point, I would probably ask participants to kind of reflect on what they notice in this monument, right? Um, some things that often come up are the fact that it is quite literally whitewashed, um, as well as the fact that it's a pretty docile depiction of what was actually a fairly violent uprising against police, right? Um, I'd also probably ask at this point, you know, what is the purpose of a monument and just spend some time kind of unpacking that. Um, I think one of the things that's really helpful to talk through with students is the fact that monuments don't just celebrate history or record history, they also help shape history, right? Um, and in, uh, inevitably Confederate monuments come up in this dialogue, uh, which I think is, is great. Um, so when Roberts made this work, they were thinking of this as a kind of monument in its own right. Um, so I would kind of share that context and often ask students, you know, what, um, how is it similar or different from other kinds of monuments you've seen and what was Roberts trying to say with this work? One of the things that I find very compelling about this piece is that it's both a monument to uh, Stormy DeLarvery's impact in the queer community and a monument to how that impact has often been overlooked. In a sense, I think it's a monument to the history of history through all of these like, um, yeah, uh, the newspaper clipping, sort of looking at some of um, images of Stormy at varying points, that use of the correction uh, from the New York Times, all of this sort of speaks to the fact that although DeLarbery had this outsized impact on New York City queer life, um, that hasn't always been adequately recognized. So yeah, so through this work, Roberts was seeking to create a monument uh, to this figure who was monumental in her own right even as she's largely been written out of history. As a follow-up activity, we've asked students variations of this prompt. Um, so what is something you would want to monumentalize and how would you monumentalize it? Uh, they can think about the same qualities we thought of in Robert's work, so text and images and form to imagine their own monument, right? This prompt could be personal. Students could consider someone in their family or community they'd want to make a monument to, for example. Um, another possibility would be to have students look at this work at the conclusion of a historic research project and then think about how they could translate their research into a monument. Um, I think that would be a really kind of compelling way to get students to think critically about the research they were doing. Um, and there are lots of other possibilities too. Uh, so with that, I am going to wrap up. Um, I hope that you found these resources useful. Uh, all of the artworks we looked at are included in the workshop booklet and you're always welcome to reach out to me with any questions. Happy to connect you with other resources at the museum, help you brainstorm project ideas, et cetera. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Julia. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julia Pelez, and I'm one of the educators here at the Center for Brooklyn History. And I'm super excited that I get to spend some time with you guys. Um, so for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you guys about how you can create and incorporate creative activities um, in your classroom that focus on LGBTQ history. 
Um, now, I'm going to be discussing themes of identity, historical erasure, and community spaces through the activities that I created and led with one of my high school students who was super interested in studying and learning more about queer Brooklyn history. Now, my goal for sharing this information with you guys is so that you could have a case study of how positive and impactful um, it was for this specific high school student to learn about um, LGBTQ history um, in Brooklyn. And also so that you guys walk away um, with a bunch of resources um, and kind of examples of what you can do and how you can implement um, these sources in your classroom um, and in your curriculum in an engaging and also scaffolded way. So let's jump into what we're going to be talking about today. So at first, um, when discovering that Brooklyn had a queer historical past, this student was super excited due to the fact that he's gay and he's spent his entire life living in Brooklyn. Um, but as time went on and he started to actually learn more and more about the actual in, uh, hmm, <laughs> intricacies, sorry, um, about this past, he started to actually get visibly frustrated and the fact that these events, people and locations were either completely forgotten about, um, they were intentionally erased, or the people actually just didn't have access to this information, to these histories and to the primary sources that we're going to be focusing on today. Um, so for him, the fact that queer history isn't widely taught or talked about in school and that other students, including his friends, wouldn't have the opportunity to learn the history, the essential vocabulary, um, and to spend time learning from these queer icons made him really sad, right? Because they're never going to know or appreciate Brooklyn for its very intricate and diverse history. And as our conversations started to progress and other historical events in Brooklyn history were mentioned briefly, like the civil rights movement um, in Brooklyn, he wanted to make sure that when he was creating his final research project, which he decided to um, create a paper that actually could be supplemented into any classroom history textbook, that he focused on the joys and the positive aspects of queerness in Brooklyn. He also wanted to bring his research to the next level, right? And he wanted to see if he can include another part of his identity, which was his love of dancing, right? So over the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking to you guys about how, um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about some resources uh, that I used and some activities that I created for this specific um, high school student um, and how he was able to talk about his identity in a safe and scaffolded way. So that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on. So we can turn to my first slide. Um, so the first resource that I want to highlight um, is this amazing, amazing site called the NYC LGBT um, Historic Site Project that displays queer historic landmark landmarks throughout the borough. Um, and you guys can see their mission um, and it reads, our groundbreaking work documents historic sites connected to New York's LGBT community, um, giving life to its often untold history and influence on America. Explore the map below, view our curated themes, or browse an index of over 350 sites. Um, and you guys can see that one of my amazing colleagues has already posted the link in the chat below. And if you guys click on that link, it's going to bring you to this wonderful interactive map, right? Um, and you can see it on our slide. So your students can spend time filtering through um, and um, discovering topics that have to deal with cultural significance, specific neighborhoods, by era, and even down to LGBTQ categories. This site is amazing. I cannot like rave enough about how much I love this site. Um, and so I want to give you an example of how I used this website to support my student when he was doing his research for his topic. So we started off super simple just by discussing this map um, and the fact that overall there are more than 350 historic sites and how there are specifically over 25 historic sites in Brooklyn, right? So after giving him some time to just kind of get comfortable and get familiar with the site um, generally and giving him time to kind of look at sites that are non-Brooklyn specific, I really wanted him to spend time focusing on Brooklyn, making sure that he was taking notes on at least five different institutions that he would want to visit in the future and to learn more about. 
Now, sadly, we don't have time to focus on all five, so I do want to spotlight two. So the first site that he did a deep dive on was the Tranny House located in Park Slope at 214th 16th Street, which was a transgender collective that operated from 1995 to 2008. And its mission was to provide shelter for trans and non-gender conforming people um, in need. Now, let's talk about his um, second deep dive on this website. And we're gonna talk a lot about his research. And so he focused on the Starlight Lounge because actually um, it was about a five minute walk away from where he actually lived. And he was so excited um, about this fact. So the Starlight Lounge was an LGBTQ inclusive bar that opened up in 1962 and was actually led by a man named Harold Mackey Harris, who was an openly gay African-American entrepreneur. So, um, yeah, so uh, we just put it uh, the link in the chat so you guys can check out what I'm just about to kind of talk about. So upon clicking that link, it's going to kind of pull up with some of the pictures that are on our slide. So it's going to provide you with background information um, on the location. It's going to give you its location on the map and it's going to give you a bunch of different photographs, right? Of this historic site throughout the years, right? Um, and luckily, Luckily enough for us, um, the Starlight uh, Lounge on this specific part of the website, there was also a short documentary about the importance of dancing at the Starlight Lounge and how dance and queerness had this intertwined relationship that led the Starlight Lounge to be a safe haven for queer Black um, community members. So, while doing the research and making sure that, of course, he was taking notes while watching the documentary, he also came up with interview questions that he would have wanted to ask uh, Harold Mackey Harris if he had the opportunity. He then went on to read supplemental materials, like this New York Times article about the Starlight Lounge's sad closing. And I had him write a persuasive essay displaying the important sociocultural and historic um, importance of the Starlight Lounge. So I do want to take a second to kind of highlight this New York Times article because I really do think that it is an amazing source. So the article is entitled, A Brooklyn Bar and Haven Teeters on the Edge of Extinction, and it was written by Susan Dominus. Um, and this article is a great source because it does, it not only gives you a lot of historical background information, right, but it helped him really kind of get his writer's voice, right, so it helped him kind of get his persuasive tone before he started to write his essay, right. So this article talks about the importance um, of the Starlight Lounge, again, as a queer safe haven, how it was a welcoming and quirky community establishment, and how it really just welcomed and wanted to take care of anyone who ever entered its store, right? And again, to kind of sum up really what this article talked about, it was a super important historical and, meaning location, uh, and meaningful location for the people of Brooklyn. This article states, but for now, lovers of the starlight worry that the bar and what it has to offer is irreplaceable. I feel bad, Mr. Mack said, the kids aren't going to have any place to go. And sadly, on July 31st, 2010, one of Brooklyn's oldest gay bars was forcibly closed due to the sale of the building. So think about all of the rich sources that we just talked about, right? We had information from the NYC LGBTQ website. He got information from the documentary. He had this New York Times article. Um, so by the end, my high school student was able to write a very well written and researched paper about the importance of this very specific queer location and its impact on Brooklyn history. So again, I would highly recommend to just spend some time looking at some of the sources that we included um, in the chat below. Um, and so again, we wanted to spend time um, researching locations, right, especially Brooklyn locations, but we also wanted to highlight queer icons. And that is when we uh, decided to focus on an amazing woman named Alice Dunbar Nelson, who was born in 1875 and died in 1935. Now, Alice Dunbar Nelson is amazing, right? So she was an American poet, activist, journalist, 
And she was a major, major player in the Harlem Renaissance movement. And at the age of 46, Alice Dunbar Nelson started to keep very detailed um, journals on every aspect of her private life, which ranged from the fact that she thought her husband was boring to the fact of budgeting money, to the fact of weather, all the way down to her relationships with women. Um, and so what we decided to do over a few days is that we spent time focusing on reading and analyzing her poetry, which an example of her poetry is um, on the screen for you guys. Um, we spent time doing a historiographical analysis of how uh, different writers throughout time, different writers and journalists throughout time wrote about her life, her achievements, and um, her queerness, and ultimately how these journalists um, outed her as a lesbian upon her death, right? So he spent time um, doing that and he also spent time creating historical timelines, right? So he wanted to make sure that he was taking all this information that he was learning about Alice John Bar Nelson and kind of superimposing it into things that you would learn in your history classroom, like World War I and the Great Depression, right? Um, so, um, after kind of doing all of these activities um, and gathering all of this information about Alice Dunbar Nelson, um, he concluded this section by writing an opinion piece on whether or not he thought it was ethically um, right for the journalists who outed her um, after she died in 1935. So, um, now I just want to take a second to kind of be mindful on how our students are kind of gathering and processing information. So like we talked about before, we've spent time looking at maps. Um, we have had discussions. We have, um, you know, come up with questions and uh, have taken notes. And so I wanted a different way for my student to kind of um, gather information. And that is when we decided to focus on the Center for Brooklyn History's podcast episode. And so we spent a lot of time looking at um, episode number three, but the Center for Brooklyn History has a podcast called Flatbush um, and Maine. And the third episode, which we spent time uh, learning from is called Queering Brooklyn Spaces. Um, and so some of the activities that he spent time doing were kind of honing in on his active listening skills. He was writing gist summaries. He was creating questions that he would have asked if he was a part of this podcast to the two historians um, that were presenting and talking about this information um, on the podcast. So in the end, um, I just really wanted to spend some time uh, giving you guys a case study that depicts the importance of incorporating LGBTQ um, sources into your classroom, into your activities, and into your curriculum. And also just give you a brief description on things um, that you can do, right? Um, and making sure that at the end of this event, you guys are walking away with some amazing resources, websites, icons, um, and fantastic uh, locations um, that we have focused on. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, and I hope that you enjoyed this short little section. Hello, everyone. We'd like to thank you for participating with us yesterday and today um, for this wonderful workshop about LGBTQ Brooklyn, LGBT, LGBTQ art and activism, stories of art and resistance. Um, again, if you are planning to receive a CTLE credit, please click on the link on the screen or in the chat and please complete the form so that we can make sure that you do receive your credit. Again, if you, are, if you, are, if you did it yesterday and today, you will receive three CTLE credits if you're only doing it for today, um, you will get 1.5 CTLE credits. I hope you enjoyed um, the discussions today about the different strategies you can use for art, activism, primary sources with your students. Thank you again for being with us tonight, tonight and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night.